So welcome everybody. It's my uh, pleasure to uh, be able to introduce our Phi Beta Kappa visiting scholar, Barbara Gross. Uh, Barbara is the Higgins Professor of Natural Sciences at Harvard University and is known for her pioneering research in nat natural language processing and theories of multi-agent collaboration, especially human-computer interaction. She's also recognized and a leader of interdisciplinary institutions in the advancement of women in science. Professor Gross is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the American Philosophical Society, the Royal Society of Edinburgh. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, and the Association for Computing Machinery. In addition to many other accolades, she recently received the International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence Award for Research Excellence, which is considered to be the highest honor in artificial intelligence. Her lecture today is entitled Intelligent Systems and Design, Intelligent Systems, comma, Design and Ethical Challenges. Please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Gross. Thank you for coming. Thank you all. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, UC Irvine has several of my favorite faculty members in AI and HCI. Um, so as you may know from reading the newspapers, it's a very, <coughs> excuse me, very exciting time for the field of AI. When I started in it, I thought that no, it would come to no practical. Well, Can we use the mic? Yeah, Just put up a little higher. No, it has to get turned on. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The trick is to turn it on. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, that, that's, that's why I wasn't a physicist, because I kept forgetting to turn on the equipment. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, when I was a graduate student, I was uh, sure I had a lifetime of work, at that, and there would never be any practical importance to it. I kind of liked that idea. Um, but uh, that was a bad prediction, and so I'll just tell you now, I'm not predicting the future of AI. Uh, uh, and it is in part because there's a lot of data out there, thanks to ordinary people like you and me, and um, because of some, uh, I, would, I would say, new techniques, but they're not really new, but this whole like, because this whole idea of deep learning is really an old idea um, that has become practical because there are now um, graphical processing units that are very fast for video games, and it was the merger of those two things that made a difference. So artificial intelligence systems have, um, entered many aspects of daily life. And what I want to do in this talk um, is to first talk about what artificial intelligence is, so that we're all on the same page about what it is and what it isn't. Um, so a very brief overview of the field. And then I want to turn to some of the ethical challenges it raises. And um, for me, it's very important that this area, um, which is both engineering and science, um, it creates new systems, and so we have an opportunity to design systems differently, um, not just to regulate them or have policies about them. So first, what is artificial intelligence? Well, it has two different aspects. One is the scientific aspect, the other is the engineering aspect. And this, the science that has driven this from its very inception is, to, is trying to understand in an operational way what intelligence is. So philosophers, psychologists, many people want to understand. Educators want to understand intelligence. The goal of AI was to understand it well enough to build something that could behave intelligently. So as I note on the slide, it's understanding the, the structures, the representations that um, a mind might have or an abstract model of a mind might need, and the processes that work on them. Um, so it's concerned with, from a scientific point of view, developing theories and models and algorithms. Um, there's also a pragmatic aspect to artificial intelligence, which is to actually build systems. This is, um, this is the, the spirit of making the systems we all use um, more useful to us that reason intelligently and act autonomously. And we now see, and I've got a number of them um, up here on the slide, a number of different areas in which people are working on this. So systems that uh, interpret um, and process natural languages and visual scenes. So what finds faces in the um, in the photos you take on your camera and Google Translate are examples of those um, that learn, that draw inferences, that can make decisions and act on those decisions. 
Um, I'll just say it's really important to keep in mind, not only in this talk, but as you work with these systems in the world, that AI is just one part of them. Uh, how many people here study engineering? Yeah, okay, so great, great, great. So, you know, your whole system has many different parts, and um, the AI by itself is no good if the rest of the system isn't engineered, and it's not smart if the two parts don't um, work together. Uh, oops, sorry, I have to go back to Alan Turing. So, um, Alan Turing, who is really the founder and the father of all of artificial intelligence, wrote a very important paper in 1950 uh, entitled Computing Machinery and Intelligence. How many of you have read that paper? Aha, uh -huh. okay, everybody else in this room, you can go online, you can find it, you can find two versions, one the original, which is hard to read because the type font is horrible, and the other is reset. You will find many of the ideas you think are brand new in that paper. It's phenomenal. The man was brilliant. You must read it. <laughs> I'm going to leave to Professor Olson here to tell you which of Doug Engelbart's papers you must read. How many of you use a mouse ever with your computer? Okay. <laughs> that you have to read the paper that Doug Engelbart wrote in 1965. Yeah. That's where the mouse comes from. Okay. <laughs> you, to be educated citizens of the world, you must read these two papers. Anyway, um, this paper uh, was the paper that introduced my, the field of AI, among other things. It's, he didn't use that term. But he was interested in, he equated thinking and acting intelligently. So he wasn't thinking about um, uh, rocket scientists or anything like that. He was thinking of ordinary thinking. Um, this was a question that was on many, many people's minds at the end of World War II because we had these big computers around. Um, what he, what's most known for, excuse me, from that paper it, what, is what has become known as the Turing test, which he called the imitation game. And he makes, he makes many predictions in this paper also. Some of them are right, some are not right, some we still haven't, uh, we don't know about. But the prediction here was that we would have succeeded in building computer systems that um, could be mistaken uh, for people, and I'll just say it um, loosely that way, within 50 years. So that's by the year 2000. That has not happened. Despite what you might read in the press, there is no computer that has passed the Turing test. None, zero, hasn't happened. Siri doesn't count. Hmm? Siri doesn't for, You'll see that in a bit. Siri, for sure, has not passed the Turing test. <laughs> but even, I don't know, was a Ukrainian guy or a Georgian guy or somebody, that didn't pass it either. Um, but here's a prediction which he makes in the very next paragraph of his paper, which is true. Since at least the year 2000, people have been speaking of computer machines thinking, and they don't get contradicted. Sometimes they say, what was it thinking when it did that? But they speak of it as thinking. And um, here, here are some of today's AI systems. Um, here's one of the most successful AI systems. How many people know what that is? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. the claims your claims your if you have if you don't have too many antiques and other stuff around it will <laughs> vacuum your floor for you. A Roomba. Uh, here's Siri <coughs> that's got a lot of AI in it. Not enough, but a lot. Um, it's amazing by the way. I, I I found this, I was astonished at what they were able to do. They did it with clever engineering and uh, its breaking points, which we'll come to in a little bit, are also interesting. But it's astonishing what it does. Um, any time you uh, use a credit card, you swipe it and it says okay, or worse yet, says not okay, that's got a bit of artificial intelligence in it that allows it to do that. Um, uh, Wall Street uses them, and of course, perhaps daily life for at least some, gen some age ranges is mostly Netflix, Facebook, and Amazon. Those systems would not work without artificial intelligence. They all use recommend render techniques, machine learning techniques, that's the heart of them. Um, and uh, this is one of many settings in which predictions are being made by computer systems. So the one I picked here is the prediction of people who are likely to come back to an emergency room and therefore you want to admit to the hospital, not send home so that they can come back. Um, there are also, as we'll come to, toys now that have a AI in them. So um, just remember, these are systems with AI capabilities, they're not AIs. 
whatever that would mean. You have to come to my talk tomorrow to hear me say more about that. Okay, so um, just to emphasize this point, the complete system, okay, so we talk about systems sometimes, we mean we mean like this is the system, but the complete system, really, anything you engineer is not just the system, but the system that includes the people that are using it. Okay, so you can't leave um, the people out. And that's the challenge for systems that are supposedly smart. So one of the most, one, one of the ones people know about the most now are autonomous vehicles. Um, here's the problem for autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. Us, we're the problem. You know, it, with the accidents they have, so I have a, I have a Google car here, but there, there's Uber, everybody's cars have had trouble. And they always say, well, it wasn't the car's fault, it was the human driver that made a mistake. Okay, so maybe evolution will take over and all of us who are acting as normal human beings now, we will die out and there will be a different breed that is, operates according to the rules. <laughs> I won't be around to see it, maybe some of you guys will. But the problem is we exist, we're here, we're here first. They have to adapt to us, okay? So one of the problems is that these systems, there are conditions that might not have been foreseen by the designers of these systems or in the data that the systems learn on. And that's a major challenge. Um, Tesla takes this approach. How, how many of you, uh, when you install software, see this box and it asks you if you agree to the uh, conditions or whatever it says, huh. and you click, how many of you just click OK without reading? <laughs> Mm -hmm. you, can't okay. you can't read it. You can't read it. Okay. Tesla thinks that they're off the hook because you get it. I don't own a Tesla. I just wrote it in mine. It says, you're the driver, you're the responsible, okay. And you click okay, and that's it. Okay. But they tell you it's an autopilot. Okay. There's a problem there. Um, so here's my, here's my claim. If you want a really smart system, it has to work well with people. Um, and so I'll get to, um, a question that many people ask me, um, which is, should we, should we be aiming to design systems that replace people or that complement people? So here's the deal. We know how to replicate human intelligence. Everybody in this room is the product of that act, which is mostly fun. It produces children but it also produces only human intelligence, and we are not perfect. So why do that? Let's do something better. Let's build something that helps us out. Okay, so I have many reasons for that. I will just say that when we're doing it, um, here's the deal. We want to build a system that's a member of a team like that, not a team like that. Okay? And that's not easy as various people on the faculty here will be able to tell you. Um, so you cannot, if you're going to put a system, if you send it to Mars all by itself and nobody from here wants to go, that's different. If you're going to build an intelligence system on Earth, it has to cope with people. So let me just uh, say an aside. Uh, one of the things I agreed to do was chair um, the standing committee that is oversight for a very exciting project at Stanford called the 100-Year Study on Artificial Intelligence. I did not promise to live for 100 years. Um, the idea is every five years, a group of people will be assembled to look at where AI is, where it's going, what the societal and ethical challenges are. Um, there's a report online. I won't um, be able to tell you about it. Um, but these are the challenge for the first committee was to, the first study panel was to look at where AI might affect life in uh, North American cities in the year 2030. What was the promise? What were the, what were the challenges? Um, we wanted the study to be grounded in an actual use, not just abstract talk about the different areas of the field. Um, and we restricted it to North American cities because um, for reasons that had nothing to do with us, but what was happening in the world, um, they had a very, they had six months to write the report and cities around the world are very, very different. So we tried to make it a semi-realistic challenge. Um, that report focused on these eight areas and I bring them here um, for two reasons. 
Um, one is that if you think about these areas, there isn't a single one of them that doesn't involve people, except maybe entertainment, where the people are only involved, involved as uh, consumers of the entertainment. Every single other one of them, there are people around. The second reason I have it is that in each of these cases, the, the AI that works today is specialized to the task that it's doing, and it's different AI in a different area. So for people who um, say to you, you know, in 10 years we're going to have general artificial intelligence, they haven't thought about how different, right? Engineers, uh, with apologies to the non-engineers, but you need to know this, engineers know that when you take two things that work very well and just paste them together, that doesn't mean that will work, right? Okay. So think about all the different ways in which you operate in the world. Plugging 10 of them together is certainly not going to work without a lot of work. Okay. Um, so this just highlights that the challenges in each of these areas are different. In some, the hardware is still not what we need. In others, we have to build trust if anybody's going to use them, and if nobody uses them, they're not useful. Um, uh, in almost every one of them, partnering with people is important. It's absolutely essential in healthcare and in education. Anybody who runs any kind of healthcare organization or any kind of educational organization or is involved in it should not take a system, should not believe anybody who says they have a system that can replace the people. Not the case if you're playing with good. Okay, so there. That, in a nutshell, is what AI is, where it is, what it might do. What I want to do next is to take a little um, snippet. Uh, to say, so I teach a whole course on how on AI and ethics, and one of its goals is to teach students how to assess AI systems. So I'm going to give you um, two possibilities. There are more, but these are two really important ones. Um, and then I'm going to turn to looking at particular ethical challenges in uh, in three different areas. So that's where we're going in the talk. Okay. So. Um, uh, assessing AI systems. One thing is to look for missing capabilities, to see how far you can push the system. And so this is one of my favorite devices. Um, I, I did early on research in dialogue systems. It takes me a maximum three questions to break any dialogue system. So let me show you. Um, Let me, let me show you this. So, so if I ask this thing, I haven't asked it recently, but I've asked it many times. Where is the nearest gas station? It gives me a list of 16. And then when I ask it which ones are open, it answers like this. Would you like me to search the web for, quote, which ones are open? <laughs> so here's the deal. And this is true, by the way. How many of you watched Watson win on Jeopardy? Uh -huh. So go back, look at the videos if you can find them. They tried to take them offline, but <clears throat> forget what Watson got right. That is totally uninteresting. It's what Watson got wrong that's really interesting. You can tell something about how the system works from what it got wrong. So here's something I've argued before. Look for the errors in systems. When, when Siri first came out, all of my friends said, have you used it? Have you? I'm like, I, I didn't want to hear about it. It's so great, it's so this. Like, Two months later, it's so stupid, <laughs> right? All right, so it's not, of course, just silly examples like this. Nor, by the way, you know these dialogue boxes? I don't know about you here. But they pop up on your screen. You do something, this dial so-called dialogue box pops up. And it says, thing. my favorite is my colleague who came to me and said, you know what it said? It said, da-da-da, da-da-da-da-da. You know, going to have to reboot, OK? <laughs> And the answer is, no, it is not OK. I was in the middle of work. You can't do it. But you can't get out of it. You have to click OK. I can tell you, I've looked at a lot of human dialogue. No human being asks that of any other human being. I'm going to ruin your world. OK, no, we don't. <laughs> we just don't. All right. So here's the thing. Some of these things are funny. But, um, but sometimes it's not funny. And that gets me to the second aspect of this, which is as human beings, um, we think that if I ask you certain kinds of questions or you have certain kinds of capabilities, then you have other capabilities. So, for example, if I asked you where's the nearest emergency room, you would know how to answer that question. Um, uh, whether you would send me to the health center or 
like Google does, to the Saddleback Memorial Hospital eight miles away, I don't know. Does your health center take care of emergencies or not? It's way far away, though. Your student health center? Oh, student health, I don't know. No, no, okay. All right, so no emergencies, kids. Okay, all right, but here's the thing. Here's what happened, honestly, this, this happened a few days ago. I tested it out then. So it will tell you where the nearest emergency room is. Okay, you ask where you can get a flu shot. This is the last thing, I've asked this several times. It's not that it doesn't understand the speech, because it's tight. Where can I get a flu shot? I don't know what it's thinking. I really don't. Okay, but here's, here's the next thing. I ask, where can I go to get a sprained ankle treated? Okay. Now, instead of telling me where to go to get a sprained ankle treat, it tells me here's a list of web pages about how to do it. But now we're in trouble. Because suppose instead of a sprained ankle, I said, I have, where can I take somebody who had a heart attack? And it gives me a set of web pages that tells me to treat a heart attack. We have a problem. <laughs> but you would think that if it knows where an emergency room is, it would know that. But of course, you have to understand what a heart attack means to understand that you want an emergency, okay? So this idea that one question, one answer, not gonna work, okay? So there's another thing to look at when you're assessing AI. You know, they say, this, this dog sings and dances, you wanna ask if it can pull the cart it needs to pull. Don't just do what they tell you it can do. It, like Siri now pops up, here's what I can tell you. They got smart. Here's what I can do for you. Don't try anything I can do for you. Okay? Not intelligent. Nobody who gets into UC Irvine comes and says, here's what I can do for you. Don't ask me to test me on anything else. Right? Right? Where is it? Right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So let me turn to these ethical domains. Um, shortly before I taught my class for the first time, uh, so I'm going to do toys first. Um, uh, the New York Times Magazine had an article on a new Barbie doll. So this was in the fall of 2015. It was coming out just in time for Christmas. Um, anybody here buy this Barbie doll? <laughs> okay. And so the, I'm just showing you dialogue here. Now, it, it, hadn't, um, it hadn't come out yet when this New York Times reporter reported on it. I can assure you from the test that students in my class did that it's still this bad. Okay, now let me give you this example because it's public. So um, uh, Barbie's found out that the kid that's um, in this, they're doing a little test, right? The kid has a sister and, and uh, asks what something nice the sister has done. And the child says, she does nothing nice to me. And Barbie says, what's the last thing, nice thing your sister did? Barbie didn't get it, right? Nothing means no thing nice. Okay, the kid is trying to, because Barbie is said, I'm your new best friend, right? That's what this Barbie doll says. Um, so the kid, having learned enough that you're supposed to be nice to friends, says, well, she helped me with my project, and then she destroyed it. Okay, the doll doesn't understand destroyed either because it says, oh yeah, tell me more. <laughs> now the kid is kind of getting that Barbie might not be so smart and says, that's it, Barbie. But Barbie still doesn't get it because the doll says, have you told her how cool she, okay, I'm going to stop there. Okay. Why did this happen? There's no dialogue model. There's no sense of dialogue. There's no semantics. There's no understanding. None. Forget that part. Okay. Right. Here's the essential ethical issue. This isn't just awkward. This is bad. It raises ethical concerns. And I want to I wanna dwell on those. But I think this is a great example in the context of all of the um, so-called machine learning and data that's going on in the world because we have lots of data, we have lots of interesting ways to compute over it, but we're missing some essential things about language. Little words like no and not, which those systems also tend to ignore, carry a lot of meaning and you can't ignore them. So the conceptual frameworks of other kinds of studies of language are really important. Okay, so what's the problem with Barbie? 
Well, to understand the problem, there are many problems with Martin, but um, my, my teaching fellow uh, said as we looked at this, I, have a, I had a teaching, technical CS teaching fellow and a philosophy student. She said, the philosophy student, she said to me, you know, this, the way Barbie is, is like the emotional equivalent of being too skinny. Okay, we'll come back to this. Okay, here's the way that the chat box, any of the chat box that you use, and, and also Barbie is covered by this. So one approach is to do pattern matching. You look for you, blah, 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 me. You turn the you into um, I and the me into you, and you get an answer. This is an idea that goes back to Joe Weizenbaum in the 1960s. He created a Rogerian psychologist system. So that was, he was so stunned by people thinking, wanting to talk to this, being upset to learn that it was not a person, that he quit the field of AI. He thought AI was unethical, there was no way to make it ethical, he was not going to do it anymore. Um, Uh, the second uh, way people do it, and this is actually how um, Barbie uh, help. There we go. How Barbie works is their templates, their hand designed things. So I've given the example here of what time do you want to have meal with person? You know, breakfast with Gary, dinner with Susie. Picks up on just the two words and attached to the what time do you want? It knows what kind of answer to generate. Um, anybody who wants to know how Barbie uh, works? It's a bunch of scripts like this, like <coughs> 250 pages of them or something. What happens if you don't mark, match the script? Okay, with, with the Barbie doll, it just keeps going with the script. That's what we saw. Didn't understand what the kid said, so just kept going with the script. Saying, well, I should try to be happy and pleasant and I'll just keep going. Okay, there's a problem there. Um, more recently, um, people have used uh, machine learning, and they've used it in um, they've used it in different ways. I won't have time to go into them. Um, the database way gets you um, uh, gets you no grammatical mistakes, but if the answer you need isn't in the database, you're torched. Um, the deep learning mistake um, always gets you an answer, but sometimes it's ungrammatical, and sometimes it's ridiculous. Um, and some of that ridiculousness is related to, how many of you know about the um, Microsoft Taybot? Yeah? How many of you know about the Microsoft Taybot? This was the chatbot that went from a teenager to a Nazi in 10 seconds because it was learning from the wrong things, the wrong stuff to do. Okay. So machine learning, uncontrolled machine learning is problematic. There's a deeper issue here, which is that Human dialogue is structured. It depends on the intentions that people have. That structure is indicated with intonation. Um, it's not just question-answer pairs. That's part of the problem with Siri. And it's not just Siri. It's at any phone system. Um, uh, so I draw your attention here to this example. I, I want you to look at this pronoun right here. So I was taught that I could only use a pronoun to refer to the last thing that matched in number and gender. I don't know, there's not, I, mean, I don't know how many of you are still taught grammar mm -hmm. anyway. But if you were taught <laughs> grammar, you would be taught that too. It's false. This is a wonderful, I don't have such good examples. Mine are all mundane. This is from where Pol uh, Olivia Polanyi and Remco Straw did. Okay, so um, the last thing that m matches them in this dialogue is kids. How many of you think that the idea here was to put the kids away? All right, so even just reading it this way, we know that. But here's what actually happened. Here's what the speaker actually said. John came by and left the grocery. Stop that, you kids! Turning to look at the kids, and I put them away after he left. If you don't understand that dialogues have interruptions in other spaces and, and have sub-dialogues, much like programs have, some processes, you can't do dialogue. Okay, so um, back to just thinking about testing and building these systems. Um, travel assistance and customer service work much better because you just force human beings to stick to what you're able to do. It doesn't work very well to force human beings, but it works better than pretending you can be a chatbot or you can um, reply on Twitter 
because those are completely open domains. You could talk, the person could talk about anything. Short dialogues, like question-answer pairs, are much easier than real dialogue. Um, okay, so, uh, so let me segue now to the ethical challenge. So this is the same dialogue before, and here's the, prob the underlying design problem with this doll. They thought they could handle dialogue with a child by having a bunch of scripts, and they could keep the child to the script. It is incredibly hard to keep people from straying from the topic at hand. We are just so, we're more misbehaved on that than we are driving. Well, maybe that's California. In Boston, the driving might be worse. Okay? okay. You can't keep adults from straying. You cannot control the conversation of a four-year-old. You just can't. And this doll is meant for three to eight-year-olds. Okay? The issue is, it's not just it's not just awkward, but it raises ethical concerns. Um, attempts to get all answers to anything a system might see will fail. There is no way to anticipate everything that a human being might do. Just not. Okay. So in particular, I want to talk about two kinds of expectations that are violated here. Um, one of them is dialogue behavior, and the other is this behavior behavior. So three to eight-year-old children are learning how to speak. They're learning what a good dialogue is. Um, what are they learning from Barbie? They're, they're, they're learning that you just say whatever you want to say and don't pay attention to the other person. This is not what you want your child to learn when they're developing language. So if you didn't have Barbie, the child would be making up both sides of the dialogue. They would be learning nothing. I should bring a little doll with me. You know? They would learn nothing from a doll that didn't actually speak. So there's a real problem there. So that language is a big problem. There are deeper, so that's just a, it's kind of not, if you, if you want to think about human development, it's affecting human development. Um, uh, it produces sentences that lead you to think it has competence when it doesn't have competence. Um, we saw already the worst thing, that it ignores what the child is saying. So we're teaching a child to ignore somebody else, but that's not good behavior. Um, okay, so then, did I bring that? Yeah, it claims to be a friend or a good, like a sister, but it doesn't really meet the expectation of friends. And it doesn't meet it in two ways. So one is, um, I just want to know, how many of you are such a good friend that you never get annoyed at your friends, you never get grumpy, and you never criticize them. <laughs> but this Barbie doll does. What message is that conveying to a child? That they're bad friends if they don't do that? So if you think in terms of the kinds of virtues you want your child to have, expect and perfect, this is where the student said it's like the emotional equivalent of being too skinny. Um, and then we get to really deeper issues, which is Barbie encourages the child to confide in it. Tell me your secrets. Okay. Everything that the kid says to Barbie is recorded on the cloud and a parent can see mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. It's a problem in general. It's a violation of the basic rights of the child. And what happens if the child confides abuse by the parent? Just think about that. Um, uh, so I'm not going to go into all of these other uh, issues. I'll just note that um, since there's now this program Westworld out there, how many people have watched Westworld? This is the best audience I've been to. Few people have watched it. It's, it, it's terrifying. So for those of you, I'm not, just if you've watched it, I'm not gonna spoil it, I promise. If you haven't watched it, um, this is Jurassic Park taken to the Wild West where instead of dinosaurs, you have uh, androids that are indistinguishable from people. And those androids are the hosts in a Western setting 
and the guests are human beings. So people go on vacation to this ranch or whatever, this western town, where there are all these androids, and they can't really, and they, and they, they look like and act like people, and the guests, that is the human beings, have license to rape, pillage, and steal. And they don't get punished for it. Okay, it's entertainment. Vidal is entertainment. Think about the model of behavior, of ethical behavior, that the, get, the human beings that would go to such a place would be learning. Okay. Most of us think, I'll say, I hope everybody in this room thinks, that if we were walking down the street and saw somebody beating a dog, we would stop them from beating a dog. Do we really want to expose ourselves to situations where there are people doing worse to things that are indistinguishable from us without doing anything? So think about, so this is a place where you can think about the ethics of building something. That, that, and when I say, when I think about the ethics, think about whether these are things that are morally permissible or should be prohibited. Not just think about whether it's the benefit of somebody being happy for a week is worth the cost of whatever it does to them. But should it be morally okay? Um, so if we're going to ethically think about the Barbie doll, um, we can ask whether the constructors of this <coughs> thought about um, things like the age of the child and what kind of home they were in. We can ask questions about privacy. So we could be consequentialists or utilitarians. We could say, is the benefit worth the cost? But we could just ask about absolutes here. We can ask about trust. What does it mean to to say to a child, you can trust me with your secrets. Children have a lot of trouble understanding trust. Um, one of the privacy rights uh, uh, questions is, so I buy it for my kid and I click OK. I give permission. You send your child to my house. Your child's voice is also getting recorded. OK. Um, oops, what, did, what was the last thing there? Um, so here's my bottom line. This Barbie doll could cause harm could cause real harm to a child. I don't think they should have made it, and I don't think that people should buy it. Um, and I was really glad that Amazon stopped selling it, even if the reason Amazon stopped selling it is it got, it got a ton of bad reviews. Ninety-some percent of them were that the Wi-Fi wasn't working, but interspersed with this with some comments like, what, are you guys crazy? You have a kid and you're not worried about what it does to them and their privacy? So there's some people who are thinking about ethics there. Um, so here I really would, um, I would take this cause harm as a way to think about it. Um, okay, we can think about this with chatbots overall, but um, uh, I don't want to spend a very long uh, time on this. Um, just noting here at the top of the slide that we can think about rights and virtues and justice and not just about cost and benefit. We also need to think about who's responsible. Is it the person who built it? Is it the person who bought it? Is it the AI, if you think about Siri, is it the people who bought, built the speech system or the people who built um, uh, Siri? You can think about it. So one of the things they could have done with the Barbie doll, they could have designed the system when the kid said something that the system didn't understand to say, you know, I'm just a doll and a machine and I didn't understand you. They could have done that, okay? Would have been less fun, it would have been less fantasy, but it would have been less harmful. Okay. So the incentive is fun and sell a lot in fantasy. Not clear that's what you want to do. Okay. You could ask not just about Barbie, but about chatbots. Um, what kind of, you know, who should govern the use of this? And who should govern the use of the data that's in it? Um, just one thing for anybody thinking about building chatbot systems, which my students do in their classes <coughs> also. Um, you build a system that generates really complex sentences. You produce in the mind of the, so the system, the chatbot, says very complicated sentences, like I put one up here. Then people think that the system will understand those sentences, not a prayer. So you shouldn't produce anything that you can't really understand. Um, one of the approaches, I won't have time to go into this, 
of many of these systems when a system runs into difficulty is to do handoff to a person. But the people using some of these systems think they're talking to a machine, and they don't want to talk to a person. So Facebook put up its uh, messenger end system, and people thought they were talking to a system, and they were amazed at the AI, except it wasn't AI, it was people. And then they were outraged, because they said things to it that they never would have said to a person. Okay, so there's that. All right, that's ethical domain one. Uh, like I said, that's in the private sphere. It's something you can, you don't, can choose to buy or not buy. Um, here's something in the public sphere, uh, which is uh, the use of large amounts of data to do to predict criminal behavior. Um, there's predictive policing, which looks at where you should put officers. This is this idea has been out there forever, long before there was machine learning. Um, but now police departments are considering using large big data and data analytics. Um, another thing is courts that are thinking of using, and in some cases using, uh, predictors of the likelihood that a criminal will repeat offense. Okay. Here's the issue. The data is itself biased. So people talk about biased algorithms. The algorithm per se isn't biased, but the algorithm combined with the data yields biased results. Um, there is much more policing in, and, and much more arrests, much, many more arrests in certain areas, parts of cities than in other parts. You get, um, so you get, you get this imbalance in what's there. Um, so the prediction of where you're going to need people so you predict where you're going to need police, you put more police there, they arrest more people, so you predict you're going to get more. Something that just feeds on itself. Um, so I want to say these are laudable goals. People have bias. But if you, if you, this is where, again, people's expectations matter. If you sell something to a police department saying it's unbiased because it's just doing machine learning over data, then you lead them to believe that they could just replace their own judgment with this machine. That's a problem. The use that the scientists thought this could be put for was to inform decision makers not to make the decision. But then you have to be clear about that's what you're doing. <laughs> so let me just give you an example of where um, bias in the data can cause a problem. Um, uh, in the in the recidivism in the repeat offense case, so what you want is for the system to be fair. Now there are different. Um, so first of all, fairness is a social concept, not a technical one. You have to map from that social context to a technical context, um, and there are different ways of doing that. Um, so in psychometrics, um, being free of predictive bias, that is to have a what they would think of as a fair test. Um, it's what, what it says up here. Um, if in the case of a criminal, the probability that you would repeat offense um, is the same regardless of what group you come from. So even if there are a lot more women who commit crimes than men, um, if, uh, if Derry and I each get a score of 20, the probability that he'll reoffend and that I will will be the same. So that's one thing you'd like. The, the prediction you score on a test, the prediction about what that means for you and for me would be the same. And that's what many of these systems are designed to do. Um, but you'd also like false positives and false negatives to be the same. If I predict you will, and you're in, uh, you're in a male population or a female population, you would like me to be wrong, either predicting you will or you won't, same amount. I don't have time to go into the mathematics, but here's the problem. If, if there's a prevalence, a difference in the prevalence among two populations, you have a test fair score, you can't have equal false positives and false negatives. So the higher the occurrences in, in, a, in a subpopulation, you get a higher false positive, that means they get sent for longer sentences, and a lower false negative. So you essentially wind up with higher penalties for people who just happen to have the wrong characteristics. Plenty of opportunity for research here. Nobody yet knows how to fix this problem. Um, so uh, just to go uh, to the general issues here, 
Um, we can ask who's responsible for the quality of data, who's responsible for removing it, who's responsible for these kinds of systems to be used right, and what's the responsibility on the designer of the system to admit where its weaknesses are. So that's a second class. Um, so those are all things that make you kind of depressed. Mm -hmm. So now let me tell you that ethics not only says what you shouldn't do, but also that you should do good. And I'm going to um, quickly give you um, uh, two examples of uh, AI uh, work in AI that's addressing social good. So one of these is from my own work, and I'm going to talk about that a bit more tomorrow, so I'm not going to say much, um, uh, in healthcare coordination, and the second is other work. Um, so I'm uh, interested in care coordination for children who see 8, 10, 12, 15 physicians. Electronic health records don't do anything zero. That's negative for helping with care coordination. Come tomorrow if you want to hear more. Um, no human being can track what 12 other human beings are doing, trust me. I, I even ask my students, they admit they can't do it. Um, okay. For those people who study teamwork, this is a really different kind of teamwork because nobody's telling anybody else what to do. The doctors and the therapists all work independently. These plans go on for a long time. If you're lucky, we want the kids mm -hmm. to live for a long time. Um, very, very, very different. The, um, uh, one of my students interviewed uh, physicians and, um, and parents about the information exchange and the information sharing problems here. Here's one of my favorite quotes. Um, she asked all the physicians whether there was ever a time that they couldn't find information in the health record system that they needed for treating a patient. And here's the response from a specialist. There isn't an example when I wasn't missing information. The parents talk about being the information conveyors. So we're trying to fix that uh, problem. And I'll just say that in the course of doing that, um, uh, we did identify the need to have a new kind of information sharing algorithm. So looking at this very practical problem, we found new hard AI problems. And again, I'll talk about that more tomorrow. So here's the second piece of work. This is um, uh, out of Milan Tambay's group, uh, done by Fei Fang, who's now a postdoc with me. Um, and uh, let's see if I can get this over here. Oh, there we go. Um, so here the idea is to use security games, which is a technical area that brings economics and computer science together. Uh, uh, Milland initially used this for, ah, oh, you guys should care about this, LAX. How many people here fly out of LAX? <laughs> okay. So uh, they don't have enough TSP people to check every car that comes in, right? Staten Island doesn't have enough patrol boats to protect every Staten Island ferry. The New York Harbor doesn't. Okay. So when Millen first um, when Millen first talked with people at LAX about whether his ideas could help them out, they they are human beings, right? So they had an interesting way. We know if you randomly assign people, that will confuse people who want to do bad. But their idea of random was. On Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, you go to terminals one, three, and five. And on Tuesdays, that's not random. Okay? Well, actually, we're very bad at generating randomness. Okay? So Millen used security games for this. Uh, I, the last time I was in LA, Millen talk, took me to the LA airport, and we got stopped. And I said, Millen, is that your algorithm? And he said, yeah. <laughs> so if you get stopped going into LA airport, it's random, and it's his fault. No. Um, so this, I just want you to watch this in, um, this is New York Harbor, where did it go? Um, this is the patrol boats, and um, I hope I turned off the sound, because you don't really want to hear the sound in New York Harbor. Um, oops, where's my, where's my mouse? So just watch what this patrol boat does. So there's the ferry, there's the patrol boat. See that U-turn? No person ever thought of having the patrol boat go a little bit of U-turn and go find somebody else. 
it makes it much harder for, to predict who's going to be covered. Um, <coughs> apparently also makes it more fun to be on the patrol. <laughs> okay? Um, so they, they, they love it and they run all sorts of simulations that show it does a better job. Um, they're also using this for, for wildlife protection. I don't have time to go into it. Um, there was recently a, uh, so I'm supposed to end at four, is that right? Yeah. More or less. More or less, okay. Uh, uh, recently, uh, AAAI had a spring symposium on AI for social good. Tons and tons of places uh, to do it. Um, general ethical principles that I think are really important for anybody designing an engineered system and for sure for AI systems. Um, the values get decided by people, not the machine. It's our society, we decide them. Um, just remember it's about doing good and not just doing evil. I personally am quite concerned about robot takeover scenarios being in the press because they're distracting us from some of these real problems that already exist. And there are more of them in healthcare and in education. Um, so when you are an engineer, when you're designing systems, you actually have a chance to design the system so it's more likely to do good and less likely to do harm. You might be able to design it so you design in capabilities to detect when a person is trying to do harm. There are people who are trying to incorporate ethical reasoning into systems. I think it's a really interesting research problem. It's really, really hard because it's even hard to get them to reason about ordinary stuff. But I think um, as Turing said about trying to get systems to reason, we're going to learn a lot about ourselves by trying to do it. Okay. You could do disclaimers. It's not. We don't have to build bad systems and then regulate them. We could build better systems. Uh, I don't have time for this, but I, I'll just use it to say I've spoken to science advisors, to foreign ministers. People around the world are concerned about the ethics of AI systems, and there are lots of interesting problems. Uh, one of the things that many people in this country and abroad are worried about is jobs. Um, so I will get back to building systems that help us rather than replace us. Um, the best techniques for machine translation, I know Google Translate does a great job, well, sort of, right? Just like the best for chats are likely to be human-computer combinations rather than replacements. Um, I'll just do all of this at once. Any, anybody who um, knows lawyers um, knows that uh, and we keep hearing about their jobs being lost. Computers are great at document retrieval. I think they're unlikely to be able to produce excellent new foreign policy. <laughs> okay? But they might help a person produce better foreign policy by getting them to think outside the box. Um, and I just want to say that healthcare delivery is similarly nuanced. So do not let your healthcare provider system tell you you don't need to see a human being that a computer system can predict and assess as well. Don't let them go that way. Okay. Um, uh, let me try to conclude. Um, I've said this before. It's really important to do complementary things. Um, I want to emphasize here in my work, um, and this is actually how I met um, Gary, Gary and Judy Olson. Um, I was really interested in modeling collaboration formally and building computer agents that collaborate. I made the claim, which is certainly proved true, that the capabilities for collaboration cannot be patched on. They have to be designed in from the start. We're born collaborating, not selfish. Okay. Really important. Ethics also has to be thought about from the start. Um, we need to design with ethical principles in mind and know no companies are set up to do that. Um, and I will tell you an anecdote from teaching. I, so I teach a course on this topic at Harvard. The stu students really want to get into it. It's one of very few restricted enrollment classes. This year, 150 students applied. That means they wrote essays, two essays, mm -hmm. for 30 slots. Uh, it was not quite as competitive the year before. I, uh, we have a class. Uh, the class is Tuesday and Thursday. On Tuesday, uh, we spent our hour and a half talking about 
the Facebook Emotion Contagion Experiment about social networking sites and uh, that make recommendations, in the case of news, um, about the ethics of that, okay? An hour and a half, right? Students who care a lot about ethics, an hour and a half. On Thursday, I taught them how recommender systems work, and the in-class exercise was to design a recommender system for a new kind of e uh, exercise clothing. Um, they had to both design the technical parts of the system, what they were based the recommendations on, and the information they would gather from users in order to make those recommendations. And we wrote all their solutions on the board. And I have to say, I was shocked the first year, but I expected it the second year. I looked at the list of information they wanted to collect, and I said to these students, who care a lot about ethics, who just spent an hour and a half talking about it 48 hours early, I said, I'm just curious how many of you thought about ethics when you made this list of information you were going to collect. None of them. Zero. Okay. This year, so, so I went back and I changed the assignment so they had to explain why. This year, one student said, well, I thought about it, but I decided it wasn't important because we were supposed to design an efficient, effective system. Okay. These are people with good intentions. They were designing for a purpose. They didn't think about something else. It's, and I'm telling you, everybody in this room would be the same way. It's just like implicit bias in the way you treat people. Our cognition is set. You get a task. You're focused on it. Um, anybody who's written a computer program knows the problem of side effects. Anybody who's written a law knows the problem of unintended consequences. OK. Um, so here's the deal. I, I'm on a new soapbox. It's, it's a computer science soapbox, but it's also for engineering. So there's a lot of engineering students here. I want to say this. Every course we teach should have an ethical component in it. Everyone. We tried an experiment uh, this spring at Harvard where we took four computer science courses. So my colleagues all thought it was a great idea, but how did I learn enough ethics to teach it? I said, I don't know enough ethics to teach it myself. I always have a teaching fellow who has studied ethics for a long time. They help teach it. So we, this, we, we have come up with this idea, which is good for us and good for the philosophy graduate student. But a philosophy graduate student teaching fellow who worked with the faculty to identify something in the course they were teaching that raised an ethical challenge to give a class and to design an assignment. The students all loved it. OK, so UC Irvine, from now on, HCI, AI, networks, has to have some ethics in it. I think the only way we're going to learn is if we have as many classes talking about ethics as we have talking about efficiency. And then all of you guys who are younger, way younger, you're going to go to companies and you're going to not let them do bad things. <laughs> That's your job. Uh, I, you know, like my student, I was there at Facebook when did it? Okay, so here's the deal. John Dunn had it right. And I guess I do have uh, this from Turing. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to hear right here. Do we have some questions for Professor Gross? The last See. quote from Turing about uh, artificially, what we now call in artificial intelligence, helping us understand human cognition, was rather famously refuted by Dijkstra, who said uh, the question of whether a machine can think is about as relevant as asking whether a submarine can swim. Where do you come down on that debate? So um, I. Uh, I think that trying to develop AI systems has taught us a lot about how people think. Okay? I didn't say building a, an a, a system that's supposed to look like a person could do it. But I know from my own work on dialogue that people in other fields have understood dialogue better because of the work I did and the way in which I described it. Okay? Um, 
it's not quite at the fundamental level, but I'll give you an example that I, it's one of my favorite examples. Um, so I, my fundamental work was in dialogue structure, but I also did some very interesting fundamental in a different way, work with Julia Hirschberg, now at Columbia, but then at Bell Labs, on intonation and the way intonation um, influences dialogue structure. I had, uh, it's, uh, I had my voice coach. I was lucky. Harvard had the voice coach for the American Repertory Theater would, um, would coach faculty, and I couldn't stand my voice, so she coached me, which is great. She oh. should do that also. It was amazing. Um, uh, so she came, to my, she came to the class I was teaching on this. Um, on intonation and discourse and where the markers are. So the first phenomenal thing is I handed out something with, with a bunch of phrases that had little annotations in the side that nobody, it was like ones and zeros, it was what the features were of the speech signal. She looked at it and she said, can I read this? And she read it as so though she had heard the tape. It was amazing to me how she did it. But never mind that. She left that and she said, I have to take this. I'm coaching people on how to be radio announcers. They need your theory. So it's in that sense I think this is important. I think we've learned about how people play chess and other things. So I think, I, I'm not saying building the system that does it, but I'm saying trying to do that when you try to understand from a very algorithmic and structural point of view what's going on, you think differently. You see things you wouldn't have seen otherwise. Yes? Hi, thank you for your lecture. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, I am a graduate student here for neuroscience, uh -huh. and something that I've been interested in is the burgeoning field of uh, intelligent neuroprosthetics. Mm -hmm. um, so cochlear implants, uh, arms would be an example, and then as technology increases, um, potentially more invasive uh, approaches like hippocampal prosthetics could <laughs> essentially be on the therapeutic market. So I was wondering what your opinion is about that, especially in the context of are we building it with ethics in mind? So I think you guys have an even bigger ethical challenge than we do. I think it's enormous. Yeah. And I think something I didn't bring up here, um, uh, but there's, there's now a, so Milan Tambe and Eric Rice at USC uh, now have a center for artificial intelligence in society and that they're very worried about. Um, which is, who's going to get this? The rich people or everybody? Right. I think that's a huge, huge issue. Is this going to make, um, drive an even bigger gap between the haves and the have-nots? Okay, so there's, there are a bunch of us. That said, there are people coming back from fighting wars, maybe they, whatever, that really need help. So talk about also, I mean, everything I raised here for AI is writ large in terms of that. One, one, and I think it's the same thing. You have to think about it from the beginning. And uh, you may need more regulation than we do, but I'm yeah. not sure. <laughs> oh, wait, there's a student back there. I want to get the student. Sorry, I've got some questions. My first I question think you're a student anyway. Are you a student? Yes. Yes. Um, my first question. Is I know you talk about building AI to work with humans, mm -hmm. um, but do you think that the elimination of certain um, manufacturing jobs, certain blue collar work, is going to create job polarization between super high skilled and low skilled jobs? Um, so uh, I I, th I have I'm going to try to give you a short answer. I have a long speech about it. Um, so I think there's going to be. In, here's the bottom line. The impact on jobs is going to depend not only on the technology, but on corporate culture. And let me give you my favorite current example, um, which we all suffer from. Uh, when you contact customer service now, whether by voice or in these chat bots, you actually get, in many, many cases, you get a computer system. And it does the best it can, and then if it fails, you get a person. After 15 minutes on sometimes. the laundry. Okay, sometimes. Okay, okay. But, but, but let's just take that model because it's going to illustrate what I want to say to you. So somebody decided when they wanted to go from uh, having lots of human people answering the phone to fewer human people that it was okay 
to have a system that was barely competent for overall, but could handle 80% or whatever percent of the cases well enough, and then to create a job that was you get a snippet of the context and the problem there and you get the right answer. You get the snippet of the next, okay. So, and, and then put all the weight on us as consumers. Okay. So that was a corporate decision about how to use the technology. They could have made a different decision. They could have looked at the situation and said, what makes the customer service thing work is the customer service person establishes a relationship and helps you solve your problem. Not that it follows a script, or she follows a script, or he, but they try to help you find the problem. So we're going to keep people doing that, but we're going to give them computer systems that help them do it more effectively. Okay? So this is what, there, for sure jobs are going to get lost. Truck drivers, Uber drivers, um, you know, with airplanes we have air traffic controllers. We'll probably have something like that. It's not going to be the same kind of job. Okay. Exactly what happens is going to depend not just on what technology we build, but on what the people who run the companies do, and what the public decides we want. So that's with respect to that. Uh, for sure, we could have, just like now, we have a society that works as well on 35 hours a week as we used to have on people working, I don't know, 80 hours a week. We're not going to need everybody to work 35 hours, and maybe we, I mean, that, this is the economist's job and the politician's job. How we, how wealth is tied, blah, blah, blah. That, that I'm not going to answer. That's another part of it. Okay, you had a second question. I'm sorry, but I, students have precedence in my world. Um, I was wondering if you think that the uh, federal government should begin enacting any sort of legislation, or sort of who should be responsible for overseeing like the sustainable development of the gap? Um, I don't think the... F I think the federal government should enable research, not try to clamp down on it, whether it's neuroscience research or computer science research. I think scientists should be ethically responsible. And um, by that, I don't mean a professional code of ethics that says, you know, do A, B, C, and D, and then you're, you're fine. I mean, people should really learn to think about the ethical dilemmas that face them and, and um, consciously make choices and be honest about what their products do and don't, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think there will be room for regulation and policy because, as I said, the, you know, maybe it's okay to build a Barbie doll, but it should come with all sorts of warnings on it, like you know, <laughs> worse than cigarettes. Maybe not. Cigarettes are the worst. Don't smoke really bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can Donald ask a question? Yes, you may ask your question now. Oh wait, there's another thing. <laughs> Barbara, thank you for a wonderful seminar. Uh, one of the roles that I play here is associate dean of undergrad education, and we have had a lot of discussion about the use of artificial intelligence for education. There are some obvious things that could be helpful, and you have all the machine learning that if the students didn't take this course, you send that message to the advisor, and there are some obvious creepy uh, scenarios that are not happening at UCI, but you can say when the student woke up and whether he or she went to the library or to the pub or, you know, and begin to... I don't have a Fitbit on because it's <laughs> nobody's business what I did. So um, my question to you is for those of us who are interested in this uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, technology and the mathematics mm -hmm. and, and, and tools for education, mm -hmm. what um, ethical things would you have us keep in mind? Okay. So it's a really good question, and I think education is an area where a lot, I actually have done some work in this area, where a lot of good can be done by, by building systems that complement human teachers. Okay. By, um, and I, we can talk more about this. Um, I think also a lot of good can be done by analyzing where students are having problems and designing a curriculum that works for individual students. I think when you start collecting massive amounts of data and predicting, right, if you're going to predict about a student, you're in the same situation as with the policing. I would be very wary of that. That's not to say not to do it, but I would think very carefully about what's the data I'm working from what are the conclusions and how I use those conclusions. 
So it's, it's really all the same. Same thing in medicine. But I think there's, there's some really terrific work being done um, by people in AI looking at um, students and student behavior and um, what kind of problems you should give people, students to work on and so on. There's a very, very rich area of research in data mining and, and student. Um, that's good for students. Was there another student? Question? Yes, there was yeah. another student. Okay, good. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm pretty fascinated by the Barbie doll uh, issue, <laughs> so thank you for bringing that up. But uh, um, do you think that we can like brush it off as like an accident? Like you kind of yeah, okay. Because there's more of them out there now, apparently. <coughs> by the way, Germany has said uh, you can't you can't sell these these toys in Germany. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, like, like in terms of like like the programmers, like can we say that that they are like that they didn't know what they were doing, like they were just trying to build like an efficient machine, or like should we like hold like the company accountable for like? Well, that I, like, I I'm going to ask you in a minute what you think. But <coughs> what happened here was there was a so it's basically the same technology that's in Siri, the same kind of voice technology, and there's a company that says you can make toys talk, and that helps companies design these things. So you have Mattel, which makes the Barbie doll. You have the Toy Talk people. I don't think you can be, you can rest responsibility on the AI algorithm itself. Right. Um, you have the parent who bought it. Right. So what do you think? Well, I mean, it sounds like it's like perfect marketing, or like like like, the, like I don't know, like the comp It's like perfect situation for the company because like. Like it makes the like the Barbie like kids would want to buy the Barbie because they like identify with Barbie and also parents would be also be incentivized to buy it because like they would want like there's I don't know there's there's they want their that, kid like, to have the latest cute cool thing no no it's like because they like the, the surveillance aspect like they can hear like what their kids are talking about like, like I don't know, like I, I feel like parents like really would want to like be able to know exactly <laughs> I, I, I need to meet your parents. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's not like I would want that, but I feel like I'm not saying that I would want that for personally, but I think like parents like would it. see the benefit in that. Like they would be like, okay, I can like keep track of my kid and see what he's doing, make sure he's safe, Sorry. that kind of thing. So it's like it's like on both sides, like it's like Sorry. perfect. Like they get so interest on both sides. Right. You're raising a really really important question here, and and let me just summarize. Right, the incentives are all to do it. Yeah. And so that. Right, and that, um, that's a place where policy and regulation are probably needed, because if the incentives are all to do it, and yet we find it morally problematic, then we need to put a regulation in place. And by the way, the fake news issue out there now is exactly this, right? What's, what's the incentives for Facebook? They just want you to love them and stay on their page. They never intended to cause this problem. And you know, so you, either you're going to get Facebook to voluntarily change their incentives, which I don't care, I would not gamble on, or you're going to have to create a regulation. I'm not clear what that regulation should be, by the way. So I think the same thing is true with the toys. But this is where, so um, this is why I think it's really important to have this in classes because you're going to find situations where you can design differently. And you're going to find situations where you're just going to need to work with the, the policy makers. Um, I still think they could have designed the Barbie differently. It would have been less jazzy, but it probably would have been less ethically um, problematic. And that's the kind of thing to think about. All right, so uh, Thank thanks for a very stimulating <laughs> I'll just want to make one other quick thank you. Soledad does so much work for Phi Beta Kappa. Yeah. She keeps us going. <laughs> and so everyone should uh, go pat her on the back or do something nice. Uh, so thanks again. I, uh, I understand there'll be another great lecture in computer science tomorrow morning. And uh, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.